Hi everybody, welcome to another story time with Sid. It is me, Sydney of Hightower, as it is every week. And here we are again with another story. This time we are starting a brand new section, Backwoodsmen and Borderers. I don't know what that means, but I know we're gonna find out. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for watching every week if you do. And if this is your first video, welcome. We tell stories and we like to delve in, I guess, into the philosophies of those stories. Um, ask ourselves questions. I think really the point of me making these videos is to entertain, of course, um, delve into subjects that I find very interesting, but also to spark conversations, because conversations about whatever they may be, whether it's history, lore, things that happened in the past, are very important to talk about, because they challenge our minds to think in the in the hypothetical, um, in the philosophical, and in the reality. Because the reality of these stories in particular is that they were founded specifically in truths of the time. And that gives us a very interesting opportunity to think about what it was like back then and look on it and say how we can be better now. So, for any more of me rambling about how much I love reading stories and thinking about deep thoughts. This is Backwoodsmen and Borders. Around 1769, when Daniel Boone struck out for Kentucky, handfuls of colonists began breaking through the Appalachian Mountains into America's vast interior. After 1794, when the Battle of Fallen Timbers opened up much of the Northwest Territory, emigration into the Midwest began in earnest. In the van went men big enough to match the new country. Solitary scouts, wise in wilderness lore, and used to stalking their lives on their flintlocks, flatboatmen and keelboatmen who had to wrestle their clumsy raft down the Ohio into the treacherous Mississippi, pioneer farmers whom land was elbow room, was worth all the hardships, and then the Native American raids and the enormous solitudes. All the men of this hardy breed had no use for modesty. They bragged outrageously of their capacity for fighting, drinking, lovemaking, swearing hard work. Their boisterous yarns not only embellished the truth, they also served to justify the crudeness of the frontier and repudiate the old gentility. Davy Crockett, who rose from the backwoodsman to congressman, gained fame and made political capital out of a braggart tradition. Closely linked to Crockett in legend was Mike Fink, the hella ferocious fellow, and an almighty fine shot, who turned from scouting to become king of keelboatmen. Similar, ring-tailed roarers were later memorialized by a young river pilot named Samuel Clemens. Other frontiersmen were credited with extraordinary powers. Daniel Boone, with an uncanny knowledge of wilderness animals, the gentle and eccentric called Johnny Appleseed with immunity to rattlesnake bites and other calamities. For time, the real and the legendary exploits of the frontier heroes were all but inseparable. I'm excited. Oh, look at this art. This is gorgeous. How Daniel Boone Met His Wife As a boy in Berks County, Pennsylvania, Daniel Boone acquired great skill with the rifle. After his father moved to North Carolina, young Boone's love of hunting, according to this romantic tale, produced unexpected results. Young Boone was one night engaged in a fire hunt with a young friend. Their course led them to the deeply timbered bottom which skirted the stream that wound around Morgan Bryan's pleasant plantation. Two persons are indispensable to a fire hunt. The horseman that precedes bears on his shoulder what is called a fire pan full of blazing pine knots which cast a bright and flickering glare far from the forest. The second fellow, at some distance with his rifle prepared for action, the deer, reposing quietly in his thicket, is awakened by the approaching cavalcade, cavalcade and instead of flying from the portentous brilliance, remains stupidly gazing upon it. The animal is betrayed to its doom by the gleaming of its fixed and innocent eyes. 
This cruel mode of securing a fatal shot is called, in Hunter's phrase, shining the eyes. The two young men reached a corner of the farmer's field at an early hour of the evening. Young Boone gave his mounted companion preceding him the customary signal to stop, an indication that he had shined the eyes of a deer. Boone dismounted, and fan Boone dismounted and fastened his horse to a tree. Ascertaining that his rifle was in order, he advanced cautiously behind a covert of bushes to get near, the, near enough for a sure shot. The mild brilliance of the two orbs was distinctly visible, whether warned by a presentiment or arrested by a palpitation and strange feelings within. At noting a new expression in the blue and dewy lights that gleamed to his heart, we say not. But the unerring rifle fell, and a rustling told him the game had fled. Something whispered to him. It was not a deer, and yet the fleet step as the game bounded away might easily have been mistaken from that of a light-foot animal. A second thought impelled him to pursue the rapidly retreating game, and he sprang away in the direction of the sound, leading his companion to occupy himself as he might. The fugitive had advantage on a considerable advance of him, and apparently had a better knowledge of the place. But the hunter was perfect in all his field exercises and scarcely less fleet-footed than a deer and he gained rapidly on the object of his pursuit, which advanced a little distance parallel with the field fence, and then, as if endowed with the utmost accomplishments of gymnastics, cleared the fence at a leap. The hunter, embarrassed with his rifle and accounterments, was driven to the slow and humiliating expedient of climbing it, but an outline of the form of the fugitive fleeing through the shades in the direction of the house assured him that he had mistaken the species of the game. His heart throbbed from a hundred sensations, and among them an apprehension of the consequences of discharging his rifle when he had first shined those liquid blue eyes. Seeing that the fleet game had made straight in the direction of the house, he said to himself, I will see the pet deer in its lair, and he directed his steps to the same place. Half a score of dogs opened their barking upon him as he approached the house, and advertised to the master that a stranger was approaching. Having hushed the dogs and learned the name of his visitant, Brian introduced him to his family and the son of their neighbor, Boone. Scarce had the first words of introduction been uttered when the opposite door opened, and a boy of seven and a girl of sixteen rushed in, panting for breath and seemed in a fright. <clears throat> Sister went down to the river, and a hunter chased her, and almost scared her to death, exclaimed the boy. The ruddy, flaxen-haired girl stood full in view of her terrible pursuer, leaning upon his rifle and surveying her with the most eager admiration. Rebecca, this is young Boone, son of our neighbor, was a laconic introduction. Both were young, beautiful, and at the period where affections exercise their most energetic influence. The circumstances of the introduction were favorable to the result, and the young hunter felt that the eyes had shined his bosom as fatally as his rifle shot had ever the innocent deer of the thickets. She too, when she saw the light, open, bold forehead, the clear, keen, yet gentle and affectionate eye, the firm front and the visible impress of decision and fearlessness of the hunter, when she interpreted a look which said indistinctly as looks can say it, how terrible it would have been to have fired can hardly be supposed to have regarded him with indifference. It may not be said that this forest maiden was deeply and foolishly smitten at first sight. All reasonable time and space was granted to the claims of maidenly modesty. As for Boone, he was remarkable for the backwoods attribute of never being beaten out of his track, and he ceased not, and he ceased not to woo until he gained the heart of Rebecca Bryan. And this is a quote from Daniel Boone. I think it is time to remove when I can no longer fall a tree for fuel so that its top will lie within a few yards of my cabin. Daniel Boone. His wife is a deer. A shapeshifter, a, a, a witch, a magician, a, um, a priestess, whatever you want to call it. Oh, that is so sweet. Oh, that would be an adorable short film. Or, ah, uh, oh, wow. Oh, that's precious. I don't have a moral for that. Um, 
except I, I suppose be careful um, be careful when you're hunting in the woods in case you almost shoot your future wife. Ah, I love it. It's so cute. I'm also just a sucker for romance. <clears throat> this is Johnny Appleseed. Johnny Appleseed's real name was John Chapman, and he was born in Leominster, Massachusetts in 1774. He did most of the incredible things he's said to have done. There are orchards north of the Ohio River today whose forebear trees sprang from seeds planted by Johnny. There are people alive today because he once warned their ancestors against the Native American invasions. Part of this account is drawn from Johnny Appleseed, Man and Myth, by Robert Price. Johnny Appleseed first arrived in the Ohio Territory around 1801. In the many ensuing years, he made innumerable treks across the virgin wilderness. It was a beautiful land laced with rivers and streams with great forests and lovely foliage, but it was inhabited by such dangerous animals as wolves, bears, vicious wild hogs, and in places, rattlesnakes. Johnny saw only the beauty and seemed to be oblivious of the dangers. Sometimes Johnny traveled on horseback. Occasionally he took the river routes in two lashed together canoes. But most often he traveled on foot. Always he carried a leather sack filled with apple seeds. He obtained the seeds from the cider mills of western Pennsylvania, to which he repeatedly made trips, and he planted them in little patches in the wilderness, selecting the spots partly for their scenic beauty. For Johnny was self-appointed priest of nature, a deeply religious man dedicated to the idea that the fruit was one of God's greatest gifts to men. He saw it as his mission to sow the seeds that would assure the plentiful fruit for the pioneers, who were then just beginning to turn their faces west. Johnny blazed trails and did his planting well in advance for the wave of civilization. He did it when, with a zealot's disregard for his own safety, let alone comfort. Usually he went barefoot despite brambles, stones, snakes, and insects, although sometimes he wore crude sandals. Once a settler, seeing him plodding barefoot through the mud and snow of November, gave him a pair of shoes, only to come upon him a few days later barefoot. Where were the shoes? demanded the donor. Johnny explained that he had come upon a poor family that needed shoes worse than he, and he had given them away. For some years his clothing consisted of cast-offs given to him by settlers, but in a later life he settled on a coffee sack with holes cut in it to accommodate his head and arms as his main costume. For headgear at one time he wore the tin pan he used to cook his food, but later contrived a long peaked cap made of master pasteboard made of pasteboard. He seemed impervious to pain and sometimes displayed this trait by sticking needles in his flesh, although not for braggadocio, for he was a remarkably modest and self-effacing man. When he suffered a sore cut, he treated it by cauterizing the wound with a red-hot iron and thus trying, turning it into a burn. Everyone respected Johnny, even the Native Americans, who never harmed him because they venerated his courage and ability to endure pain. The settlers loved him for his kindness and humility, and even the boys of the small, rough towns never teased Johnny, whose strange appearance might as well have made him one of their favorite targets. Little girls adored Johnny because he brought them scraps of ribbon and pieces of calico. He was welcome in any remote cabin where he might stop for a night's lodging. He habitually slept on the floor, and before bedtime always read aloud from either new, the New Testament or from the works of Emanuel Swedenborg. As he took out his books, he often said to his listeners, isolated farm people, hungry for news, I will read you some news right fresh from heaven, Johnny had, according to his own matter-of-fact account, frequent conversations with angels. The Native Americans did not bother Johnny even during the War of 1812, when they roved the countryside as British allies to assist them in the war. For that reason, Johnny could and did act as a Midwest Paul Revere, warning farmers of the approach of Native American and British marauders, and giving them time to take refuge in the often distant, fortified blockhouses. At times, he traversed the region day and night to warn every cabin in language full of stirring biblical phrases of the approach of the enemy. Although Johnny was selfless and never had any possessions, he seldom was completely without money. He charged the settlers who could afford it, his little groves of seedlings, and he was a shrewd planter, locating his nurseries so that small trees would be ready for transplanting when the settlers penetrated to them. However, 
Johnny spent almost nothing of what he earned on himself, preferring to use the money to help animals. He could not bear to see any living thing suffer or die. There was no society for the prevention of cruelty of animals along the advancing frontier, and often a settler's horses or livestock had a cruel time, frequently being turned loose to die when they were ailing. Hearing about such cases, or encountering them, Johnny would buy the animal from its owner, nurse it back to health, and then give it to another settler on condition that it had to be well treated. Or he would pay for the animal's winter lodging until he could find a good pasture for it in the spring. Johnny even opposed the pruning of, or grafting of apple trees, feeling the cuts caused the trees pain. One cold night, he extinguished his campfire because he noticed that it was drawing mosquitoes and that some were coming too close to the flames and being burned to death. On another occasion, when a hornet got inside his clothes and stung him repeatedly, Johnny removed the insect with care and set it free. There are many more tales of Johnny's kindness to animals. Once he was out along the trail and a rattlesnake fastened its fangs in Johnny's right hand. A Native American who was walking with Johnny struck the snake and killed it. And Johnny reproved him sharply. The snake didn't go to hurt me, he said. He just didn't know any better. When Johnny found a wolf caught in trap and badly hurt, he released and nursed it. The wolf became a pet and followed Johnny around, like a dog, until someone shot it. And an old hunter used to tell that he had chanced upon Johnny in the deep wood, playing with three bear cubs while the mother bear calmly looked on. Perhaps she was the same creature that he had befriended when, some time before, Johnny had built his campfire one cold night at the end of a hollow log. He intended to crawl into the log for the night. He discovered, however, that a bear and her cubs were already there. Poor innocent things, Johnny is said to have remarked. I'm glad I did not turn you out of your house. Then he carefully removed his fire and slept on the snow. Johnny's resistance to cold was phenomenal. Once he started across Lake Erie with another man, barefooted on the ice. Night caught them in the middle of the lake. The temperature suddenly began to drop. The wind rose, and in the bitter cold, Johnny's companion froze to death. Johnny, however, kept warm by rolling about vigorously in the ice and eventually crossed the lake, none of the worse for the ordeal. He would never touch tea or coffee because when he got to the next world, he said, he could not have them, so he would not cultivate a taste for them here but milk and honey were different. We read in the Bible that this is heavenly food, he pointed out. He drank milk whenever he could get it, and loved honey. Wild honey almost literally flowers at times in the Ohio woods, but if Johnny found a bee tree, he always looked carefully to see whether the insects had sufficient store for the winter before he touched a comb. Johnny preferred to always take his lunch and supper by him, to which he repeatedly made trips, and he planted them in little patches in the wilderness, selecting the spots partly for their scenic beauty. For Johnny was self-appointed priest of nature, a deeply religious man dedicated to the idea that the fruit was one of God's greatest gifts to men. He saw it as his mission to sow the seeds that would assure the plentiful fruit for the pioneers, who were then just beginning to turn their faces west. Johnny blazed trails and did his planting well in advance for the wave of civilization. He did it when, with a zealot's disregard for his own safety, let alone comfort. Usually he went barefoot despite brambles, stones, snakes, and insects, although sometimes he wore crude sandals. Once a settler, seeing him plodding barefoot through the mud and snow of November, gave him a pair of shoes, only to come upon him a few days later barefoot. Where were the shoes? demanded the donor. Johnny explained that he had come upon a poor family that needed shoes worse than he, and he had given them away. For some years his clothing consisted of cast-offs given to him by settlers, but in a later life he settled on a coffee sack with holes cut in it to accommodate his head and arms as his main costume. For headgear at one time he wore the tin pan he used to cook his food, but later contrived a long peaked cap made of master pa pasteboard made of pasteboard. He seemed impervious to pain and sometimes displayed this trait by sticking needles in his flesh, although not for braggadocio, for he was a remarkably modest and self-effacing man. When he suffered a sore cut, he treated it by cauterizing the wound with a red-hot iron and thus trying, turning it into a burn. Everyone respected Johnny, even the Native Americans, who never harmed him because they venerated his courage and ability to endure pain. 
The settlers loved him for his kindness and humility, and even the boys of the small, rough towns never teased Johnny, whose strange appearance might as well have made him one of their favorite targets. Little girls adored Johnny because he brought them scraps of ribbon and pieces of calico. He was welcome in any remote cabin where he might stop for a night's lodging. He habitually slept on the floor, and before bedtime always read aloud from either new, the New Testament or from the works of Emanuel Swedenborg. As he took out his books, he often said to his listeners, isolated farm people, hungry for news, I will read you some news right fresh from heaven, Johnny had, according to his own matter-of-fact account, frequent conversations with angels. The Native Americans did not bother Johnny even during the War of 1812, when they roved the countryside as British allies to assist them in the war. For that reason, Johnny could and did act as a Midwest Paul Revere, warning farmers of the approach of Native American and British marauders, and giving them time to take refuge in the often distant fortified blockhouses. At times he traversed the region day and night to warn every cabin and language full of stirring biblical phrases of the approach of the enemy. Although Johnny was selfless and never had any possessions, he seldom was completely without money. He charged the settlers who could afford it, his little groves of seedlings, and he was a shrewd planter, locating his nurseries so that small trees would be ready for transplanting when the settlers penetrated to them. However, Johnny spent almost nothing of what he earned on himself, preferring to use the money to help animals. He could not bear to see any living thing suffer or die. There was no society for the prevention of cruelty of animals along the advancing frontier, and often a settler's horses or livestock had a cruel time, frequently being turned loose to die when they were ailing. Hearing about such cases, or encountering them, Johnny would buy the animal from its owner, nurse it back to health, and then give it to another settler on condition that it had to be well treated. Or he would pay for the animal's winter lodging until he could find a good pasture for it in the spring. Johnny even opposed the pruning of or grafting of apple trees, feeling the cuts caused the trees pain. One cold night he extinguished his campfire because he noticed that it was drawing mosquitoes and that some were coming too close to the flames and being burned to death. On another occasion, when a hornet got inside his clothes and stung him repeatedly, Johnny removed the insect with care and set it free. There are many more tales of Johnny's kindness to animals. Once he was out along the trail and a rattlesnake fastened its fangs in Johnny's right hand. A Native American who was walking with Johnny struck the snake and killed it, and Johnny reproved him sharply. The snake didn't go to hurt me, he said. He just didn't know any better. When Johnny found a wolf caught in trap and badly hurt, he released and nursed it. The wolf became a pet and followed Johnny around, like a dog, until someone shot it. And an old hunter used to tell that he had chanced upon Johnny in the deep wood, playing with three bear cubs while the mother bear calmly looked on. Perhaps she was the same creature that he had befriended when, some time before, Johnny had built his campfire one cold night at the end of a hollow log. He intended to crawl into the log for the night. He discovered, however, that a bear and her cubs were already there. Poor innocent things, Johnny is said to have remarked. I'm glad I did not turn you out of your house. Then he carefully removed his fire and slept on the snow. Johnny's resistance to cold was phenomenal. Once he started across Lake Erie with another man, barefooted on the ice. Night caught them in the middle of the lake. The temperature suddenly began to drop. The wind rose, and in the bitter cold, Johnny's companion froze to death. Johnny, however, kept warm by rolling about vigorously in the ice and eventually crossed the lake, none of the worse for the ordeal. He would never touch tea or coffee because when he got to the next world, he said, he could not have them, so he would not cultivate a taste for them here but milk and honey were different. We read in the Bible that this is heavenly food, he pointed out. He drank milk whenever he could get it, and loved honey. Wild honey almost literally flowers at times in the Ohio woods, but if Johnny found a bee tree, he always looked carefully to see whether the insects had sufficient store for the winter before he touched a comb. Johnny preferred to always take his lunch and supper by himself outdoors, seldom eating inside a house. Through much of the year, in fact, at least in his vig vigorous younger period, Johnny did not bother many housewives or landlords with requests, for log with, with requests for lodging. Who would want to sleep in a cabin floor if he could have, for instance, 
the luxury of a tree-swung hammock. There, as happy as a king, he would sleep and read or sing when resting from his labors. Johnny preferred to always take his lunch and supper by himself outdoors, seldom eating inside a house. Through much of the year, in fact, at least in his vigorous younger period, Johnny did not bother many housewives or landlords with requests for lodging. Who would want to sleep on a cabin floor if he could have, for instance, the luxury of a tree-swung hammock? There, as happy as a king, he would sleep or read or sing when resting from his labors. By the time Johnny was in his early sixties, the areas which he had traversed so diligently and planned so richly, the Ohio River Valley, the lands along the Licking and Muskingum Rivers, and White Woman's Creek, were filling up with people. Johnny felt his work was done in that region, so he toured the houses through the area and took farewell of his friends, and then moved west, and for the next nine years he planted in western Ohio and Indiana. One warm evening, when he was 72 years old, he appeared at the home of the settler in Allen County, Indiana. And although he was invited to eat with the family, instead he took some bread and milk to own the doorstep and watched the evening sun go down. Later, he read the Beatitudes aloud and then lay down on the floor to sleep. Next morning he was found, dying and speechless, but in that state of utter tranquility peculiar to a man who is certain of where he is going next. And that was Johnny Appleseed. There's more beautiful art, so please let me show it to you. This certainly is an interesting chapter. I have heard of Johnny Appleseed before, but I haven't heard so many different Legends. He certainly sounds like an incredible person, doesn't he? And it is interesting because I think if someone like that to were to exist in our time, I'm not sure he would be as well revered because we exist in an age where so much is ridiculed. Alternative lifestyles are ridiculed. And when a person is just being themselves, even though it might not necessarily fall in with the society, that's one of the most beautiful things that you can do, especially when you are kind and you're doing your best to better the world. There should be more people like that out there, at least in my opinion. Anyway. That is going to be part one of Backwoodsmen and Borderers. So, join me again next week for another story, for another section of this chapter, if you like. And I hope that you are all staying happy, healthy, and safe. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next week. Bye!